So we're here today, um, presumably because everyone here has a bit of an interest in plants and plant health. That's certainly why Helen and I are here and, and holding these sessions. So just as a, another um, question to you to get a bit of a feel for who we have on, on the line today, what I've done is I've, I've placed um, types of gardens on this picture here. So if you um, keep with your annotate feature, just put a, a shape or a tick on the kind of um, garden that is your, your special place. Um, and I'm sure everyone has found that during these times with, with the pandemic, gardens are becoming more important to us than ever. I've placed the, <laughs> the courtyard garden is there because that is um, what I wish my courtyard garden looked like. So if you, even if you can't um, enjoy your community garden at the moment, if that is your special garden place, just put a, put a shape there. Whoops. Apologies. Great. So we've got a, a lot of backyard garden, gardeners and a few community gardeners there. I myself, I have a courtyard garden and a, and a, a balcony garden. What kind of garden do you have, Helen? Mine, as of only a couple of months ago, is the medium large on the large side. Um, but prior to that, a courtyard garden. So, yeah. You can variety. do a lot with them. Indeed. All right. So the, the topic that we're going to be exploring over the next few weeks at a, at a broader level is plant biosecurity and plant health. Um, and we're going to narrow in on... Um, really insect pests, but we're also going to talk a little bit about insect beneficials that you might find in your garden. Um, some insect pests and beneficial species are quite familiar to us. So you might recognize this, um, this insect here. It's been um, put on many posters and it's a subject of, of a lot of um, awareness activity. It's the Queensland fruit fly. It's a plant pest that we find sometimes in the Melbourne region, definitely in other parts of Victoria and um, up uh, the east coast of Australia. And a common beneficial species next to it, which is the ladybird beetle here. But we are talking plant biosecurity and that also includes plant pests um, that we don't have um, in the country or we don't have um, in all parts of the country. So, I've got a, a few pictures here showing some other examples of plant pests in this case. And these examples are those that we would not be so familiar with. So on the left here, we've got a caterpillar, which is a species, um, the common name is fall armyworm. And in fact, that's a, that's a new pest to Australia. It, it first entered Australia in February um, of this year, and it's found at the moment throughout um, parts of the north of Australia. And there's a couple of photos from overseas and these photos really do show the kinds of impacts that um, plant pest species can have on, on our environment and, and plants. So down the bottom, we have the um, impacts from a pest and disease complex, complex that causes a, a disease called citrus greening, which is something that in particular, um, California and Florida orchards are, are dealing with at the moment. And we have the impacts of um, pest um, from the western bark beetle species up the top here. You can see that it's caused this tree die off here. So that's going to be one topic of this series is exotic plant pests. We're also going to cover some of the lesser known or less recognised um, beneficials that we'll often find in our gardens. We've got a hoverfly on the left here, we've got a lacewing larvae up the top and down the bottom right, does anyone know what this insect is? The black body and the orange banding? Does anyone want to take a guess? No? That's actually a ladybird, ladybird beetle larvae. So they can look quite different in their larval form. So what we hope to, um, to do over the next few weeks is to um, raise your awareness around plant biosecurity and, and plant health. It's a real interest and, and passion of myself and Helen. And um, to do that, we're going to share some stories with you about um, problematic exotic pests of, of garden crops in particular that you'll find overseas. So 
Obviously, there are plant pests that can impact on native species, environmental plant pests, but we'll focus on the, the crop pests. We're going to try and um, get you excited about um, exploring invertebrate ecology in, in your special green space and, and how to do that. So we'll talk about um, how to monitor for garden pests and also for beneficials and where to report to if you find something that's a little bit unusual in your garden. And we're also going to talk about tips to maintain a healthy food, food garden through um, hygiene tactics. So here's, uh, here are some of the faces that you'll see over the next few weeks. We have Helen McGregor, who's on the line tonight from Redefining Agriculture. She'll be speaking tonight about our particular urban biosecurity project, but she's also going to speak in week four about garden hygiene. Uh, myself, you'll see me in week one to week three. Today I'll be speaking about exotic plant pests and presenting a few case studies. I'll also touch on beneficial insect species you'll find in your food gardens and also common garden pests in the particularly Melbourne region. We're very lucky to have a special guest speaker, Dr Lizzie Lowe, joining us from Macquarie University next week. Uh, Lizzie is quite well known um, for her work looking at urban ecology and she'll be talking to us about beneficial insects and particularly spiders which you find in your garden and how to encourage them. So she has a real passion for spiders. And Aaliyah Pirtle from Caesar uh, will be taking us through tips for pest monitoring in your garden, also monitoring for beneficial species of which she has a lot of experience. And she's also um, the one who has produced these um, brilliant illustrations for us that you'll see as the backdrop to our slides today. So very talented. So why are we here today? Um, using your annotation tool, I thought before we get started, it might also be nice to share what your interest is in being here today and, and what you want to get out of the session. So I guess at a broader level, what I want to achieve is I want to live in the city and walk out the door um, and see the concrete jungle livened up by green and, 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 and feel like it's a living city. So that's really my interest. But I'm going to invite you all to share your interest in being here today and also of the coming weeks if you'll follow us um, throughout the month of August. But also open up the floor if anyone wants to verbally share um, why, they're, why they're here today. I will ask Helen as my co-host, what, what is your interest and, and reason um, for, for taking part in this, Helen? Um, I think that, which we'll come to a little bit in you know, some of the work we've been doing, but the opportunity to support and grow communi like-minded community in terms of food growing and urban greening. So, yeah. I think that sort of underpins and and that, that the notion of you know the shared abundance that can come from that, not just in terms of the food we produce, but our um, creation of space for ourselves. Excellent. Now, what you can do with your annotate feature is go to the format button and you can actually format your text if you want to make it bigger. And I'm actually, I'm actually just moving the text around a little bit as we get some answers come in. Oh, we've got part of an answer there. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm seeing is there's a bit, um, there's, there's, there's a definite interest in learning what are the good bugs and bad bugs. And it's, it's great to see some focus on beneficials there. We're certainly going to yeah. cover them over the next few weeks. Right. I'm going to clear that. So I'm just going to hand over to Helen now, who's going to give you a bit of an overview of our particular research project um, before we delve into the topic of exotic plant pests. So Helen, I'll open the floor to you. No worries, thanks Jess. Um, welcome everybody, fantastic to virtually see you. Um, and just before I get going on the project, I'll just um, spend maybe five minutes running through the project work that Jess and I are currently involved in together. But I do feel um, it's important that I acknowledge 
um, the the video and the music that you heard at the beginning was um, from formidable formidable vegetable sound system. So not only yep yep thanks Max, and not only um, appropriate in context, but uh, awesome group of individuals. So jump online and check those guys out if you liked what you heard. Bit of a plug for them since we're using their <laughs> we're using their material. So basically a, a bit of an overview of what we're doing. So you know we've got this fairly formal title, Urban Plants Plant Biosecurity Using a Foundational Approach to Understand Emerging Risks, Support Resilient Cities and Safeguard Rural Industry. And I suppose the approach I've taken to this is it's it's really become um, more about understanding the people that sit behind um, urban greening, particularly in terms of food growing um, in the Melbourne community and understanding who's who and how they're connected. And so what we've sort of set out to do is better understand the more informal um, networks that exist and how they could be better supported, how we could engage um, groups of people that are really interested in this space, like, like all of you who are here tonight, to provide you with resources that have a, I suppose, they're going to be helpful, it's going to be helpful for yourselves, but it also contributes to a greater good. Next slide, Jess, please. So why this project? If any of you are um, Northern Mel Melburnians, you'll recognize this is um, series uh, Joe's Market Garden on the Merry Creek. And it, it's a fantastic example of a, a large area um, where there's food growing activity on a, at a commercial level, you know, well within the, well within the city. So, why this project? The next few slides will just sort of run you through a little bit of what we're exploring. So the objective that we set out with is we wanted to bring together um, key um, parcels or foundational data parcels and looking at aspects like land use, overlaying that with um, some spatial analysis of where growing activity is happening, um, Jess has done a lot of work looking in in terms of, I suppose, in a, through a social sciences lens, looking at um, building an understanding of how these networks are communicating and functioning, what people, what, what knowledge people have, what knowledge people are seeking, and you know how they're making decisions about um, how they build that knowledge for themselves, or how and then how confident they are in terms of extending that knowledge in terms of potentially reporting or asking for assistance. We chose Melbourne as a case study. It is well recognised as you know sort of the premier area in terms of um, urban greening and, and particularly in terms of food growing. There's a lot of activity here, but our plan is to be able to to um, sort of use the methodology and and place it over another urban environment and they would they would get the same benefit from using that. Thanks Jess. So plant health in the city is has always and will always um, play a really important role and uh, you know what's been happening since early this year that the, the circumstances that we find ourselves in societally right now uh, you know has really amplified that and um, some of the other effects are things like examining the importance of canopy cover as we see um, a, a global or you know an overall increase in temperature. Um, there's increasing work being done looking at the psychological effects or the mental health effects of spending time in greened areas. And you know, for a long time we were talking about having to leave the city to seek that out. And I used to get quite frustrated and ask people to walk down a street with rows of street trees and you know you are always amongst nature you can actually never be apart from it so i think starting to better understand um, those various aspects is important and you know this is in the context of the graph on the right hand side where that's a projected population increase in greater melbourne over over time so that's not news to any any of us i don't think that you know we're going to see an increase in population density over time Thanks, Jess. 
So there's been a lot of work done in this area. These two um, chunks of information, the, the, um, the map and then the table um, on the right hand side of your screen come from the Superint Melbourne group and the link to their work is down the bottom. So if you Google those guys, they're doing a lot of work, um, some really important work looking at supply chain and around the context of food security and supplying food into the Greater Melbourne area. Um, looking at land use, access to land for growing. Um, so there's a lot that's going on with that group. But some of the information, this comes from a 2015 report that they produced. Um, and it, and it, you know, it's a really nice snapshot of not only the inner and in grey um, urban area and then that, those outer areas in green and blue extending it out into the, you know, the larger rural landscape. Um, so you can sort of see spatially what that looks like but also the figures on the right hand side in the table, if you have a look down those, that's the percentage of production lost projected in the um, Greater Melbourne Food Bowl by 2050. So you can see that there's a, you know, there's gonna be a projected decrease in, in production um, with an increase in population. So clearly there are gonna be increasing issues around that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and you know, bearing in mind that um, food production in a in a within and then I suppose you know on the immediate perimeter of an urban area is not new news. We've been doing this as as um, city dwellers for for a very long time, but we're sort of increasingly challenging our capacity to do that, and then starting to need to find ways to actually build some resilience into those systems. You know, in our current situation with um, COVID-19 has really brought it home in terms of the difference between long um, supply chains um, compared to, you know, those, those shorter, more localised um, food supply chains. Um, I'm sure many of you have, have already experienced or tuned into that. And this is an infographic, again, that comes from the Foodprint group and just, you know, highlighting that we often sort of think of things in, in terms of silos, like community gardens growing food in the city or people growing food on their balcony compared to water treatment, compared to somebody farming on the urban fringe or in a peri-urban area. But there, we're all actually part of the same community and those different activities um, are not separate. They cannot be. Um, they're actually all integrated and they all influence one another. So sort of bearing that in mind, um, I think is really important going forward. So I suppose coming back around to, you know, thinking why is being aware from a biosecurity perspective important? And often um, people think of biosecurity and food security very separately, but plant health and biosecurity are, you know, they go absolutely hand in hand. And if we haven't got healthy growing environments, because we've got some major challenges and they can be, um, they can be in terms of regional, uh, you know, pests that are endemic in or commonly found um, in particular areas, moving between areas and creating difficulties for particular growing groups, or they can be exotic pests, which, you know, Jess has already mentioned and, and we'll talk a little bit more um, in a little while. So what, what did we, what are we doing in this project? We're bringing together GIS um, data so we're mapping spatially the networks including community gardens and their key influences so nodes of, of activity and knowledge and key knowledge brokers within the urban environment and then we're overlaying um, things like um, high-risk locations to pest establishment or traffic routes for potential traffic routes for, for pests. And we're starting to look then further and further out into the beyond the Greater Melbourne area, you know, into the more commercial areas where you've got larger commercial um, uh, businesses growing food, supplying Greater Melbourne, and looking at interactions between the urban environment and those those communities. And this is not about, you know, there's sort of been a bit of a myth um, around the risk that um, food growing food in an urban environment presents to those communities. And we actually want to flip that on its head and suggest that we think a higher level of awareness and activity and engagement in the urban environment could actually 
really, um, I suppose, support those activities and then has the potential to provide us a, a sentinel type network um, so that those larger scale production systems are less likely to be impacted because things are picked up um, sooner. So this is just a, a an infographic kind of if you're a you know if you're a, <laughs> you prefer things in visual form, then these this really just starts to unpack some of the layers that that we're building. But it, it's really just to demonstrate that it's a kind of stepwise process of bringing layers of data together that can be represented spatially. And we're also looking at things like reach of community gardens. So we're actually going to visually map that and see where those networks overlap and where the gaps are and so that we can um you know we can then also propose to <clears throat> councils or on a regional basis where there might be some more support offered to communities so where there's a lot of activity and not a lot of support you know that's that's going to come out in this data thanks jess so i suppose to sort of round it out what we want to do is understand the existing networks and the potential that, that they offer and offer ways that they can connect within themselves because we're very aware that there are some key growing demographics who are not particularly well connected to maybe for example the community gardens network and there's likely to be benefit um, you know in connecting in connecting those communities to get all those networks together um, we want to ground ground truth these these networks that we we map so we're basically gleaning data to understand the potential networks that could exist but we want to make sure that those networks are actual and practical um, and that you know their existence their existence is is real and as i've mentioned there's the opportunity to replicate this across other environments and for them to utilize that data for things like extension education policy development so that it's, you know, it's wholly supportive of growers, both in the urban and peri-urban and, and areas beyond. Over to you, Jess. Okay, take over from there. What, so what I'm going to do is just um, very quickly present a couple of um, results from the social research that's um, come out of this project and a previous project that I ran. So last year I sent out a survey um, and I gained responses from people living in Melbourne City, but also living in regional Victoria. And I was quite interested in, um, first of all, looking at the profile of the kind of person who's, um, who would be most likely to report an exotic plant pest if they found something strange, but also um, if there was a difference between uh, those living in rural areas and brought up in rural areas and those living in um, and brought up in urban environments. So on the right here, I've just um, put in a graphic um, and it's the result of around um, 400 and, um, 450 responses total, but in this case, a couple of hundred responses from that um, entire survey group of people living in a, a rural area and um, their barriers, um, why they would be less likely to report an exotic pest. Um, now, I do actually have the data for, for people living in an urban environment, but I'm currently um, going through that. But what I will say is, from the data that I've analysed so far, the barriers to reporting are very, very similar between both groups. So at the top, not having confidence in figuring out if a pest is unusual is absolutely the top um, barrier. The close second is unsure, being unsure about the correct um, reporting process. And then um, the third is being uncertain about the kind of risk that an exotic pest can pose. But um, it's, it was really interesting looking through this data because um, throughout, um, if, you, if you look at the total respondents, which is um, this first bar in, in blue here, but also if you um, look at those living in an urban um, environment and brought up in an urban environment so um, the, the second blue bar there and then compare that to those living in a rural environment their willingness um, to report an exotic pest is actually very very high and there's um, not much difference between the two groups at all these other groups are just subpopulations based on um, upbringing upbringing in a city or upbringing in in a rural environment so there's not much difference at all in terms of um, the proportion of respondents that were 
um, of a low likelihood to report compared to of a high likelihood to report, which is fantastic. So I guess um, through this series, what one thing we really want to do is, is to encourage people to become more familiar with what's in your um, green space in terms of what is what should be characterised as as normal throughout the year um, during any given season and what is unusual. So I'm going to start, um, really, I'm going to kick off the talk about exotic plant pests. And there are an awful lot of exotic plant pests that I could speak about, um, those that are already in the country and contained and um, potentially um, expanding their distribution um, at the moment, uh, as well as exotics that we don't have in the country at the moment. And I'll be focusing on the latter. Um, and there has been an awful lot of work undertaken by production industries and also government trying to keep an eye on these exotic pests, um, which are termed priority exotic plant pests, um, and characterise them and prioritise them as which ones rank at the top for those that we should be aware of and undertake awareness activities about. And generally the ones that end up um, as the top ranking pests are those that are quite polyphagous, so, so those that eat lots of different kinds of plants. Um, and so therefore, if it arrives in a new place, it has a high potential to survive and establish. And also those that are very good at spreading. And it's particularly the types of um, transmission pathways, as they're called, how they spread is one thing I'll be focusing on today. And there's some really interesting examples I think you'll find quite surprising. Um, so really what I just want you to take home from this um, slide, this is an example of the kind of risk assessment that goes on within a production industry to look at what are the kinds of exotic pests that an industry need to be aware of. And there's a lot of work done in production industries to try and raise awareness around what, what is an um, unusual pest and what these um, high priority pests might look like in, in the field. And you can see on the right there, there's um, ratings for entry potential, potential establishment, spread potential, so how far can they fly, are they good at hiding in um, a, a piece of fruit, for instance, and getting carried to a new region, and their economic impact here. So generally, um, it's um, not terribly common for an exotic plant pest to A, enter and B, become established, but it certainly does happen. I think biosecurity officers in Australia are a little bit like the tooth fairy. There's a lot going on at the borders, a lot of inspections, things found on ships coming in, for instance, that are stopped at the border. So generally, you might have a um, whole range of pests that are very good at traveling um, between regions or between countries. And in the case of Australia, we have risk assessments that take place to look at um, the spread potential of these pests and regulations are drawn up that dictate um, how another country can trade with us and the kind of um, uh, measures they need to put in place to make sure that the commodities they're trading with us um, have a low risk of spreading pests. But occasionally you do have arrivals. And at that point, we have things like port inspections and airport inspections by the federal government. And occasionally you do have escapees. And when that does happen, um, sometimes there is a response by state government and federal governments, uh, the federal government to um, try and contain that pest um, or eradicate that pest, so get, get rid of it completely. And it's not always possible. So um, in some cases, pests do establish and we then need to um, usually quite quickly learn how to live with them. And particularly um, for production industries, they can lead to some severe economic impacts. And they're also just not the kind of thing you want to deal with in your home garden either. So I obviously can't cover um, all pests um, on these lists. And our intent is not to teach you how to identify all of these exotic plant pests, but really to just uh, make you a bit more aware of um, the kind of impact they can have and particularly impacts on, on our lifestyle and um, impacts on what we love to do, which is gardening. So the first story I'd like to tell starts with a scenario. So just imagine you're watching TV and it might be with your partner or your friend or a pet and you realise you've forgotten to shut the, the bedroom window. So you run upstairs and you find that every surface of the room is absolutely covered with bugs. And over the next year, you find them just everywhere, in your mattress, in your hairdryer, 
in your jewellery box, um, in the bath, and you count 26,000 bugs over the next six months until you finally stop counting. So that is exactly what has occurred overseas in, in some instances. And this particular bug that I'm talking about is called the brown marmorated sink bug. Some of you might have seen this photo. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a popular photo in relation to the sink bug, which is um, becoming um, a pest in a lot of countries overseas and, and, and it has um, been for the past 25 years or so ago when it did start to, to spread from its, um, its original um, origin in, in China. So you can see here they're getting swept up from this porch in the hundreds or even thousands. So they are a lifestyle pest. They're not very nice because they get into small spaces. The reason why they're common around ha um, homes is when the weather cools down, they um, start to cluster. So they'll release an aggregation pheromone um, and they'll cluster together and then they'll overwinter in, in people's houses. This is what they look like as, um, as eggs and also nymphs. So they look a little bit different. Um, the stories that I'm telling today, um, I refer to what's happening in the US a lot. And the reason is I um, did a study tour in the US in 2017, where I learned about a lot of these pests. So in the case of BMSB, um, it's been found in, in recent years in, in Europe, particularly um, in Italy, there's some, some issues with it there. But it was first found in the US in 1996 or thereabouts. And then it started spreading throughout the, um, the East Coast. And over the last um, few years, it's also been found on the West Coast. And it's commonly found in urban environments at the outset. Because it's a polyphagous pest and it likes to overwinter in people's houses, urban environments really suit it. So here you can see the bug. It's, it's pretty normal looking as far as sink bugs go, unless you're a taxonomist. It has these white stripes on its antennae and white markings on its back end here. You might think it's quite large, but in fact, I was quite surprised when I got to know them a little bit in the US. It's really quite small. It's only about 12 to 15 centimetres in length. And you can see it's got the wings there, so it does have really high spread potential. And you can see from this map um, taken from iNaturalist, particularly on the West Coast, these iNaturalist um, detections, you can see that there is an outbreak um, up north near Sacramento, Los Angeles, and also um, in Oregon near Portland. So these are some new urban environments that it's been found in in recent years, and they're slowly spreading out to agricultural areas. And when it's awake during the summer months and it's quite lively, it really does enjoy feeding on tree fruit crops. And then later in the season, when the tree fruit crops are harvested, it will begin to um, move on to vegetable crops. Um, and then it will overwinter in people's houses. And you can see the damage on the right here. You get the, some dimpling on the outside of the fruit. It's a sucking insect. So it will stick its proboscis into the fruit um, pulp. And it will actually release um, enzymes as it's feeding on, on, the, on the fruit tissue. And as a result, you get this um, corking effect. You can see on the, on the top right here of the fruit. And early fruit rot, early fruit drop. Um, feeding on flowers is also a problem. So you can get real, quite severe impacts on, on your fruit trees. Um, the apple industry in the US has actually come under um, a lot of um, pressure from this bug. Um, so there's, some, there's been fairly significant economic impacts for the apple industry in the US. And when you think about Melbourne and proximity to um, Goulburn Valley, which produces most of the pears in the country, and, and in fact, most of the apples, it could, be, could lead to a severe economic impact in, in this state as well. Just wanna show you how, how bad these are, can actually get in an in a orchard situation. So this is, it's a, it's a bit jumpy at the start and then it clears up. But what you'll see in this video is, this is brown marmorated stink bug in an Italian apple orchard. And this is not from a harvester. This is from a mower. So they've been mowing and they've picked up just thousands and thousands of these bugs. 
So they can, they can reach extraordinary numbers. And you can just imagine, you don't want them clustering on your fruit trees at home. That would just be too difficult to control. <laughs> Um, where could it live? So a bit of modelling um, has shown um, that these dark areas, these, these dark green areas are where it is um, potentially going to be happiest in terms of um, where it will live. Uh, it, it appears in Florida and the US occasionally, um, and the dots, I should, little squares I should say, are where it's been found, although this paper is from 2012, so it's changed somewhat since that time. Um, it's found in Florida occasionally, usually people carrying it in in their cars, um, not, not knowingly. Um, but it is thought that photo period length plays a really important role in actually where it can live. So um, it tends to stay up more towards the northern um, parts of the US. But you can see, if you have a look at Australia, certainly southeastern Australia is, is dark green, as is Tasmania. So that it could potentially be quite, um, quite happy in Australia. So we have had incursions of BMSB in, in Melbourne um, and, um, and it does happen quite frequently in terms of them coming in, um, in with trading goods um, in, in shipping containers. Does anyone want to take a guess why we'd find them in shipping containers coming in? No? Yes. Well, Whilst everybody has to think about that, um, oh, Sarah said nice and warm for winter. Sorry, yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And um, yes, just sorry, whilst um, whilst they're thinking about that too, um, we've got a question. What are the morphological features that can help us tell them apart from native stint bugs? So that's a good question. There's, we have a fair few native stink bugs and um, the there are morphological features such as those little white um, parts of the antennae that I showed you um, and also their size. But a, a big feature of these particular stink bugs is the way that they aggregate in, on crops and also the damage that they can do to crops um, is, is a lot more impactful than any of the, the native stink bugs that we would have. But the federal government has actually produced a really nice guide um, showing the differences between brown marmorated stink bug and other um, stink bugs, so native stink bugs that we would find in, in Australia. Um, and that's absolutely something that I can circulate to the group um, after. Um, and you can have a flick through that guide and, and you can actually share that to your respective community gardens. Um, but in the term, in the case of BMSB, it would really be the damage that it inflicts on crops and um, the way that it aggregates, which is probably going to be the, um, the thing that makes you think this is a little bit strange. I should probably ring someone about this and, and take a photo. So uh, we did have a, an incursion in Melbourne in 2018 of BMSB. Um, and it did come in um, through traded goods through the port of Melbourne. And we actually, over the course of a couple of months, found um, three detections in the city. And um, the biosecurity got onto it very quickly and eradicated the bugs that were found in these imported goods that had come from Italy and um, undertook surveillance the following season. And as it stands, we don't have BMSB in the city, which is, which is a big plus. New Zealand have been doing a um, really nice awareness campaign on this particular bug. I'm just going to show you a video here of one of their oh, awareness. The brown marmorated stink bug. Look at it. Imagine thousands of them in your home. Because in the winter, that's where they end up. Your nice warm home. Oh, and by the way, when they're crushed, they stink like sweaty socks. They're not in New Zealand yet, and we really want to keep them out of the country and out of your home. So if you find one, don't kill it. Catch it. Take a photo and call 0800 80 9966. Ooh, the brown... So, as I was saying um, earlier, and that question around why would we be finding them in shipping containers, of course, uh, 
mentioned I mentioned at the beginning of, of the talk, when the weather cools down, they're looking for um, places they can take shelter and where it's a bit warmer and they aggregate together. Um, and of course, shipping containers are pretty perfect in, in terms of shelter. So the federal government every year sends out requirements to our trading partners around um, what they need to do um, to safeguard their shipping containers um, to limit spread of BMSB. But of course, there are quite a few countries now that have BMSB. So biosecurity officers are kept pretty busy um, inspecting shipping containers to make sure that it doesn't actually get into the country and establish. Ooh, the so the next case study I'm going to talk about is giant African land snail. This is a pest I learned a bit about um, when I visited Florida in 2017. Now it might not look like this snail um, looks very different to other snails. Uh, however, when I um, came up close with these snails in, in a laboratory um, in Florida, I was asked, did I, did I want to hold one? And I very quickly said no, but I'll put my pen up against it. Um, and this, you can probably see why I said no, I wasn't really keen on holding this absolute giant of a snail, but it's, it was, this is exactly why it's called the giant African land snail. Um, and it's highly polyphagous, so it can eat over 500 species of, of plants. Um, and, and it absolutely loves vegetables in, in particular, and you can see how ravenous that these um, immature snails are, yeah. So it can do damage to fruit and vegetables. Um, it's also a um, concern in terms of uh, food safety because it, it carries a, a, a nematode called rat lungworm, which can cause, um, can cause an infection, um, which, is, we can, which can lead to some um, serious consequences. So that is exactly why Florida is um, doing all they can to try and eradicate this, this pest. And they had previously um, tried to, well, they previously did eradicate it um, in the 60s. And it was for a, a fairly um, large amount of money in the millions of dollars back then. So um, you can imagine how much that would equate to now, but that is how serious they are about getting rid of it. We've in fact had a couple of incursions of land snail in Australia, one in the 70s in, in Queensland that took um, a while to eradicate, but it eventually was eradicated. They can also create slick spots on, on streets, so they're a bit of a risk there. And their shells are, are very, very hard. Um, they actually um, can feed on um, concrete um, and, and use those nutrients to harden up their shells. So they can create um, shrap shrapnel when run over with things like mowers. So they can be a, a real pest, a real lifestyle pest um, in that regard as well. In terms of how it can spread, um, so it's, it's pretty interesting in, in regard to this snail. If you get online, you'll find a lot of people um, like having these snails as, as pets. Um, this is a book that often um, comes up if you search giant African land snail. And you can find um, a lot of sellers online selling African land snails as well. So there are those um, less usual pathways that potentially could be um, a risk in terms of land snail um, spreading from region to region or country to country. The most interesting um, pathway I've ever heard about for any pest is how um, the, the giant land snail got into Florida um, more recently. Um, so the, the first incursion event in the 60s actually occurred because a young lad had gone on a holiday um, and he'd actually brought home on, on the plane a box of land snails as, as pets um, and that ended up being becoming quite a, a large and costly eradication campaign um, for officials over there. More recently in 2010 a batch of snails were found um, in the backyard and the owner was actually a practitioner of a, a type of religion, it's um, a religion called Ifiarisha and he'd actually smug smuggled the snails into Florida in his luggage and someone else had also smuggled snails in under her dress on a, on a flight. And the reason that they were bringing them in is, was um, to use in a traditional ceremony where they would crack the, the shell and then ingest the mucus. 
Um, so that's definitely the most interesting pathway I've heard about um, that has led to a, a, an exotic pest outbreak. Are there any questions before we move on? Um, Jess, there was just a, a question um, about whether we'll give a mention to apps, phone apps that people can be using to help them identify pests. So I don't know whether that's for, I don't know whether that's for now, but I just thought I'd flag it. Um, that's come up. Yep. Um, so we'll be covering that particular question in week three when Aaliyah will be um, presenting on methods to monitor ecology in your backyards, but also um, to monitor and report exotic plant pests. But certainly in the meantime, we can send through some reading material on that as well. So the last case study I'll talk about is a very um, tiny fly. It's called spotted wing Drosophila. And I've, I've called this case study Berry Monster because as you, as you can probably guess, for a food source, it absolutely loves berries and other soft fruits like stone fruits, plums, um, cherries, grapes as well. This is what it looks like close up. Um, it looks like a lot of other Drosophila species that you would see, and it, and it particularly looks like one that we, we have here, which is a cosmopolitan species called Drosophila melanogaster. You might know it as vinegar fly. Um, so it's very similar and um, telling um, this fly apart uh, from something like the vinegar fly can be quite difficult because they are very small as well uh, and they're cryptic in, in the way that they look. But the male flies do have these little spots on their wings that you can see the tips of their, of their wings there. Um, why are they a crop pest? Well, Unlike most other Drosophila species, um, which might lay their eggs in rotting fruit that's already um, pierced or, or laying open, this fly is capable of laying its, its eggs in fruit that's still growing and um, still on the vine or still even ripening or green. And it does this because the female has an ovipositor that is serrated. So it looks a bit like a bread knife and it can ovipositor straight into the fruit. And once it does that, um, larvae will mature in the fruit and become pupae. And during that time, the fruit may drop or the pupae and larvae may drop out of the fruit or they might remain in the fruit on the, on the vine or stem. But in a lot of cases, the larvae will burrow into the soil and they'll pupate and they'll emerge as adult flies and the cycle will start again. So for a lot of its life cycle, this, um, this fly is actually protected within the fruit. And this is a big reason why it can spread fairly quickly between countries and in fact has, there's a picture of the larvae there and also the eggs on the right. And some more pictures on the, of eggs on the bottom left here and a larvae on the fruit on the right. And that's something that you won't see with a fly like Drosophila melanogaster in Melbourne is these larvae in fruit that is um, on the vine and ripening and in other respects, perfectly fine. So overseas um, yield losses when the fly is not actively managed um, can be quite high. So I've got here a schematic graph showing um, from research that's been done at CESA, average yield loss um, over um, time since the first incursion over years. And you can see that raspberry comes out at top, on top in terms of um, yield loss. And you can see also that average yield loss over time does decrease. And that's um, one aspect, aspect of that, at least, is people learning how to manage this fly better. And overseas, there's been a, a lot of work go, look, going into trying to figure out how to best manage it. And a lot of that comes down to cultural controls. So particularly um, hygiene of the area in which you're growing host crops. So making sure that you're picking fruit very regularly and not leaving them get overripe on, on the stem and picking fruit up um, off the ground as well is very important. And this is, just shows how quickly this particular fly can spread. Um, I've got a time point here in 1980 on the left where it was found in Hawaii. And then if you move forward to 2017, you can see every 
year or every couple of years, it's found in more and more countries. So it does spread extremely quickly. And that's not necessarily because it's flying to new places, it's because it's able to essentially hide in fruit as a larvae and the fruit is being transported around um, via trade routes um, to new places. And you can see on the right here, this is also some work done at Caesar by James Mayno, some um, modeling of where spotted wing Drosophila could live. Um, so these darker areas, these orange and purple regions are where it would be quite happy. And eastern, the eastern coast of Australia is, is quite optimal for this fly. So here are the adults. As I've said um, earlier, you get these dark wing, wing spots in, in the male of the fly. And the male is a little bit smaller than the female that you can see on the right here. And it has a slightly darker abdomen on the end. And the female doesn't have quite the same darkness on the abdomen and it doesn't have the wing spots. So what would probably make you raise an eyebrow if we were to have spotted wing Drosophila in, in Melbourne is, is going to be the damage that you're finding to your soft fruits in the garden. They're very small. These flies are only about three millimetres. So <laughs> to have a look at their morphological features, you, you probably do need a hand lens. Uh, some of you might have thought um, and noticed that the life cycle is a bit similar to Queensland fruit fly which also obviously lays eggs in fruit and it goes through that developmental cycle and then um, it emerges as an adult from, from the pupae. So I've just put um, photos of both side by side. You can see spotted wing Drosophila on the right here and on the left Queensland fruit fly. A major difference, apart from many morphological features, but what you can see by eye is the difference in size. So the male spotted wing Drosophila is about two to three millimetres, whereas Queensland fruit fly is a fair bit bigger at about seven millimetres. And another map from Caesar. This is another map created by James Mayno, and it shows just how quickly spotted wing Drosophila could potentially spread over the, um, a, a, a spread rate over a time period of six years if it were to enter via an incursion point on the east coast of Australia. So you can see how quickly that it would spread. And this is an absence of containment measures. I guess um, next week we're going to talk a little bit about ecology in your gardens and how you can become a little bit more familiar with ecology in your gardens. Um, picking out what is unusual can be really hard. And we certainly don't expect everyone to learn um, morphology of um, you know, all the priority exotic pests out there. But I guess um, what we would like to encourage everyone to do and think about is um, when spending time in your, in your green place, just be mindful that um, you make observations throughout the year and learn what is normal and what is perhaps not normal for that particular season. Um, is your produce showing damage that you wouldn't usually see? Are you finding larvae in them that you haven't seen before? Um, one thing we'll go over in week three is we'll talk about traps, shelter traps, pitfall traps, other traps that you can put out in your garden to get a bit more of an idea of what pests are in your garden. And also get familiar with your knowledge sources where you can find out more about common garden pests. And also, we'll also go over this in coming weeks, know who to call if you find something unusual. And I've placed this up here. This is what's called the exotic plant pest hotline. So it's a hotline number that you can call if you find something that looks a little bit strange. You can call that number. And what it will do is redirect you to your State Department of Agriculture, depending on the state that you're in. Are there any questions? No? Look, I um, think... Jess, sorry, the, there was one question about the... Um, has the snail been found in Victoria? No. No, it hasn't. It's, it's been found um, a couple of times, but both cases were in um, Queensland. And not recently either. So we're, we're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, before we, before we sign off, what I'd like to invite everyone to do is um, have a really share um, where you generally go for information about your garden pests. Um, and please um, feel free to, um, to share to the group as well 
either through annotating or also um, verbally. And also, are there any um, questions about the presentations tonight before we sign off? So Kaz has asked, will we have access to this presentation? Yes. So um, what we'll do is we'll edit this presentation and make it a bit um, of a shorter file and then we'll send that out to the group. Um, so um, you could uh, watch this again or you can actually send that video on to, um, to your network as well. Thanks for sharing everyone, your information networks. Um, Helen, is there anything you would like to add before we close off for the night? Um, not, not really. I mean, I think the main thing is thanks all for joining us for the, for the first session. We really hope to see you back for the rest of the series. Um, be great to you know, build a little online community here and feel free to share this opportunity, the opportunity to join with your networks as well. Um, and you know, if, if you have any thoughts or questions that pop up in the meantime, then stash them somewhere safe and we'll try and, we, we'll try and address them next time as well. Very open to questions and discussion. Yeah, so next week we have uh, Lizzie Lowe. She'll be talking about beneficial species in your garden. Um, and also, I'll also add a little bit about beneficial species you'll um, often find, particularly in your um, food gardens. And um, I'll also be sending out a little bit of um, pre-session learning material as well, if, if you want to learn more. And I'll, I'll add on a guide to BMSB identification and how to um, split them out from native species. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining um, us on our first, um, the Urban Green um, se session for, for the month.